we are beginning our snowy northern landscape here as we generally do in the sky with our large round-headed brush. It's a great brush for the sky because it doesn't have any sharp edges and of course it can render very smooth aesthetics. Now I wanted to do something very bright, very surreal and so I'm starting in my sky with a purple. This was a mixture of primary red and primary blue with a lot of titanium white. Then, while it's still very wet, I'm taking a darker mixture of that, just with less white, and I'm applying that around it with a subtle blend in the middle. And then I'm taking a darker version of that purple, I mixed in a little bit of black, and I'm working that around the edges now. Again, I'm doing it quickly so that it all blends fairly cohesively. And if you're ever having an issue with doing that in a good amount of time, you can always mix in more water with your pigment and it'll very much take away that quick drying time. So here you can see we have a nice subtle little blend up from that bright central area moving out to the edges. It looks like a vignette and it really brings the eye in closer towards the painting. So from there, I'm now going in and I'm drawing a number of mountains. And I'm doing this partially with gray, as mountains are, but also with a little bit of purple and blue. Because these mountains, the color of them, it's going to be reflected on by the sky. So it's going to inherit a number of those colors and you want to ensure that they are accounted for so that it looks cohesive, so that it looks like it exists within that same world. So there you can see that I took a lot of purple and that's kind of at the bottom, that's the darker area. And then on the lighter side, I'm just using more titanium white. I'm trying to ensure that one side of the mountain is brighter than the other and I'm also just kind of doing it messily. I want to ensure that all of my mountains are different, that they are staggered, and then once I have the tops done, I move into the middle, as you can see, and I just roughly work in some additional highlights, some little pathways. If you could imagine just going up this mountain, taking a path or whatever, that's exactly what we're doing. That's the idea there. So with that being said, I've now let the sky dry almost fully. However, it's still a little bit wet. We did use a little bit of water to help it be more viscous. So I'm taking that large round-headed brush and I'm going back in and I'm tapping all of these little speckles on there. And I'm not using any additional paint. I'm simply picking up the paint that's already on there and moving it slightly. What this is going to do, it's going to take away the streaky aesthetic that we initially created because we did use a little bit of water and it's also going to make it look like there are implied galaxies and clusters of stars very, very far away. Very subtle ones, mind you. These aren't bright, these aren't white, these aren't blue or glowing. They're just very, very far away. They are speckles and clusters. We'll add in legitimate ones later, but it's a great base to start on. So with all of that being said, I'm now taking a purple that's fairly close to the brighter purple that I used initially, and I'm working it in a circular motion at the bottom of my mountains. And what this is really going to do is ensure that I have a soft base for them and a very soft transition into the foreground. It makes it really easy than drawing a million little trees leading up this mountain and getting them progressively smaller every time, right? It acts as a very natural transition and takes away a lot of work. So with that being said, I'm now making a plethora of little hor or vertical strokes moving upwards. And these trees, we generally think of trees as being green, and they have a little bit of green in them, sap green, but primarily there's a lot of purple in there because again the sky is going to reflect its colors down upon all of this and so all of it's going to change in accordance to that sky, to those colors. So that's also really important to remember when you're doing a painting. Don't think of its natural color, think about the environment it's in and then apply those colors to whatever object you are rendering. So instead of having plain gray and brown mountains, we have purpley bluey gray mountains. Instead of having green trees, 
we have trees that have more of this blue, more of this purple, and it'll really help. So from there, I'm going in with my larger square headed brush, and in horizontal motions, I'm applying snow. Now this snow looks very dark, right? And generally when we think of snow, we think, oh, it should be white. But again, it's about the reflective nature of everything. And snow is especially reflective. It should really match the color of your sky to a point. And this is a darker painting, so the snow itself needs to be darker. We will go in and add a highlight on top of it, but we do need a dark base to work on initially. And having these multiple values, these multiple colors, are really going to help ensure that it has volume, that it has depth, because if it were all white, if it were all very dark gray, if it were all one color, it would look completely flat, it would look like a cartoon, but it's having the varying colors kind of roughly blended together, and the light hitting it, that's what's going to make it look much more real, much more three-dimensional. So I'm going to let a lot of that dry, and I'll go back and add the highlights on later, but now I'm working on the water, the stream here. So I'm grabbing blue, as that's a fairly natural color, but it does have a little bit of pink in it, and we'll definitely go back in and add more pink as well. You notice that the value of it and the color, it's very similar to the snow right now, and that's also important to note, that it is at the same level in the painting as the snow, and so it should look fairly similar at this point. We can add highlights and differentiate between the two, but naturally speaking, subtlety is correct. And so you can make it surreal and you can make them very different, and I do end up doing that. But just recognize, whenever you want to create realism in something, creating subtlety is generally the way to go. So you can barely tell the difference between the two colors. But in real life, that's generally what you're actually going to see. With that being said, this is more of a surreal painting, and so I did take more of a white, and again, predominantly in horizontal strokes with a little bit of a ledge, I'm creating highlights to my snow. And this is essentially the parts of the snow that are being highlighted from the light in the background, right? So these are all of the areas that are just going to be a little bit brighter that the sky is touching, and then everything else is going to have a little bit of a shadow cast upon it. With that being said, I'm also going back down now into the water, and again, in horizontal strokes with my square-headed brush, I'm just mixing in some purple. I'm leaving the edges of the water a little bit darker, as they will have more shadows cast upon them, but the middle, the center area here, is certainly going to be brighter, and it's going to have more of a reflection of the sky. Again, much like the snow, I'm going to let my water dry, before I go in and rework on it, because I don't want it to get muddy, and I want to be able to apply new colors that don't mix with the colors we already have implemented now. That's really important. Sometimes you do have to wait to get what you want in painting, even when you do quick little paintings like this. Then I'm taking a very old, rough, square-headed brush. The bristles kind of go everywhere, and with the tapping effect, I'm creating these silhouettes of trees. It's very simple, using a mixture of sap green, black, and a tiny bit of white, and as you can see, we're just drawing on very rough trees. I like this brush because it can create a myriad of different pieces of foliage. It's very random, it's very natural, and it ensures that all of my trees look a little bit different from the one next to it, which is highly important. I'm also ensuring that the bottom of my trees is much larger than the top, and there, you saw, I, I did a tree and I didn't really like it, so I thought I'd just show you, when you don't like these things and use enough water, you can just scrape them off the painting and redo it. It's so quick, it's so easy. You can only do that when it's wet, you can only do that when you use water, but if you're thinking about trying something, make the paint very watery, try it, and if you don't like it, you can just scrape it off and fix it fairly easily. Just a little tip, um, I know I do that a lot, just to see if it's going to look like I want in my head on the actual canvas. So with that being said, here now I'm adding snow in the same way I normally add stars. I'm taking a lot of water on my brush, a little bit of white paint, I'm peeling back the bristles and letting the paint 
fly over at the canvas. And it just creates such a magical little effect. It's such a quick, easy, wonderful effect. I love it in stars. I love it in snow. I find this process to be just so cathartic. And you can make the snow bigger or smaller depending upon how close or far you keep the brush from the canvas. Now, from there, I'm taking that same very ratty old kind of broken down square headed brush and I'm applying highlights to my trees. You can just see that the snow is falling on them as well. I'm using the same brush to create the inconsistencies and I'm really happy with the way that turned out. As always, I cheated. I'm not going to lie. I spent a couple extra minutes, but that's what I ended up with. I'm really happy with it and I hope you're really happy with what you create as well. So thank you so much for watching. I post every Saturday. I hope to see you next Saturday. And above all, stay creative.